What a beautiful ball. Now it's Cristiano Ronaldo with a chance maybe to seal it. And he has taken it. Love in all kinds of space. Love. Muller through Muller. Could be embarrassing. It's three. Tony Cross. Olivier Giroud. Marcus found Klein with a speedy burst. And that's terrific from Vardy. Oh, what a goal by Jamie Vardy. Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast or hashtag TFHP Euros. That sounds so pretentious, doesn't it? But it's quicker than the Football Hipsters podcast. So that's what we're going to go with. I am your host, Chris, and it is day one, day one of the competition and therefore game one of the competition, France versus Romania. This is the first of many podcasts we'll be doing throughout the European Championships. And uh, if you listen to our preview show, uh, which I'm sure you have if you're listening to this, then you will know that we'll be back every single day there is a game and we will be covering it. And I'm going to be joined by lots of different guests throughout the uh, the tournament, some special guests and some of the regular panel. Uh, tonight, I've got one of the regular panel. In fact, my, uh, my co-host of the English Breakfast, I've got Ross with me this evening. So good evening to you, Ross. Good evening. And I've also got a special guest. First first show, so we had to get a special guest on. We had to get somebody who knows a bit about France, didn't we? So welcome back to uh, Double Interviewee. It's Rich Allen. Good evening, Rich. Uh, good evening. Uh, right, we'll jump straight in with you, Rich, while we're, uh, while we're on the subject of France. Um, we'll come back to Ross's thoughts on the opening ceremony in a minute, because I know he wants to share something with us. But before we do, uh, let's just get your sort of thoughts initially over the uh, the result, France running out 2-1 victors in the end. We'll drill down into the game in a bit more depth in a second. But what did you make of the performance overall? Um, they got the win, ultimately. That's that's the main thing. That's what we can take from that. Um, it, 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 was not, it was not particularly fun at times as a France fan. Um, they, were, they were made to work by a pretty, pretty organised um, Romanian side, but... Um, there was, I think it, it, I, I tweeted earlier, it, I think it's raised a few more questions than I think it's provided answers. So um, where they go then into their next match will be, be interesting to see. Yes, it was um, very sort of um, scratchy and scrappy throughout the game. Definitely. We'll, we'll definitely uh, drill into it in a second. Ross, um, just sort of going back on to, uh, or sort of taking a backward step. Um, Rich was lucky enough to miss the opening ceremony. Yeah. Um you, however, saw it a little bit bizarre, wasn't it? Yeah, well, no more bizarre than any other Olympic opening or football opening you've ever seen. But yeah, it was, um, wasn't the easiest to understand, I didn't think. And I certainly think the London Olympics did it a bit better. But uh, yeah, it was it was interesting enough, I suppose. And you had a particular bugbear of yours? Oh, yeah. Feel, it's, feel it, free to share. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just because I, when I was at uni and at college, I did a, I did a radio show called Spoon All That Jazz. So I'm I'm a massive massive fan of old classic jazz and swing songs and they butchered la vie en rose by putting some electro swing behind it and honestly if, if you if you thought that song was catchy go and listen to the louis armstrong version and and realize that that is the true version la vie en rose is a beautiful song and, and that did not do it justice but that's that's just me being geeky about music Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. We'll have a, a Music Hipsters podcast coming soon to a radio show near you. Anywho, um, right then, Rich. So let's, um, let's sort of start with the lineup then. Now, um, I'm going to get ribbed for this in a bit because I looked at the lineup and, and it was pretty much, I think, what was expected uh, from France, especially anyway. Um, I was surprised that Anthony Martial didn't make the starting lineup. Um, and I'll, I'll, hang my, I'll hang my hat on this and say I thought that he would get in or should get in ahead of Dimitri Payet, who, of course, we will touch on in a minute. Um, I was clearly wrong, and it's, it's why I don't manage France, obviously. But what did you make of the lineup? Was it what you expected? Was it what you would have gone with? Um, it's what I expected. Um, I, I did. I, I did think Payet was was going to just uh, sneak ahead of of Martial to to get in that starting lineup. In terms of what I I want, I don't know. I'm I'm quite I'm quite uh, quite a demanding person um, when it comes to my my France lineup. In so much as as I was evidenced tonight, Payet, as great a player as he is doesn't really work as a wide man in a 4-3-3. Um, he works perfectly as a central player, um, you know, in that slightly more advanced role where he can he can operate 
wherever he wants um, up, up that end of the pitch. But to utilise him in a 4-3-3, um, at times it just leaves whichever flank he's on at that point, because him and Griezmann did swap quite a lot. Um, it just leaves whichever flank he's supposed to be operating on incredibly bare. And at times, not a, not a, quite a lot of times during that game, both Evra and Sanya were left very, very exposed. Um, due to just primarily due to I think that that four three three formation, um, and the fact that Paye drifted inside so often, it it works well. That's how he plays. But I think a thought has to be put to there's a bet there's a better formation I think in this France lineup that can utilise these players in a in a in a better way. And I'm not sure if Paye has to play. Obviously, um, you know he was a star man tonight. Wonderful goal. Um, but he, he, I don't think he works best, and and France won't get the best of him um, uh, in a four three three. I I was completely with you, and I'm so glad that you you brought up that sort of idea that he's not really a wide man. That was exactly the reason why I had had um, Martial in in that lineup. But um, nevertheless, as we say, he had a he had a hell of a game, and um, we'll definitely um, sort of focus on him in, in a moment. But uh, Ross, coming to you. For a second, it, it didn't start particularly well for the host, did it? I mean, it was um, a fairly sort of lacklustre start, and barring uh, sort of a very, very good save from Hugo Lloris, it could have been a goal down very early on because Romania, you've got to say, he's got a score there, hasn't he? Was it Stanku? I think it was at the back post. Yeah, I, I, I think I said this in our WhatsApp group um, while we were watching the game. Personally, I think that was a, a worse shot than it was a better save because there's. Uh, Half the goal is empty for, for that shot, and considering how good a finisher Stanku actually is, I would have expected him to put that in. But um, he's put it straight down Lloris's throat, and Lloris deserves the credit for being in the right place at the right time. But I think if you're Stanku, then you're kicking yourself for missing that. But um, the, the the opening ten minutes, aside from the pressure that, um, that that Romania had, it was more about the organisation. It was more about the two banks of four, um, and just just moving along the pitch and keeping the keeping the midfield shut down. It was. From from my perspective, as someone that, as I've said on this pod a million times now, I, I love the defensive side of football. It was very, very impressive to see a team like Romania, who you didn't really, or I, at least I didn't expect to have that much quality defensively, to be that well organised and that well drilled. It certainly put um, put a lot of emphasis on the on the French midfield, and they couldn't really find a way in the first ten minutes. Agreed, and and just sticking with you as well for a second. With given that sort of situation, with that chance, do you think? Uh, no disrespect to Romania, but a better side, um, you know, exposing as Richard was just saying there, exposing down the flanks and with that overload, they get punished, won't they? If that happens again against a, a more clinical side. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll probably talk about France and how they will look against other teams later on after we've covered the game. But for me, um, it was it was very concerning to see a France team that. I think are one of the, well they they are one of the favourites and I think they will do they will do well in this tournament, but we've all noticed that the back line is not as strong as it could be, and other teams are not idiots they will see it as well. Uh, I I do fear that if Romania could have some of the spaces and some of the chances they did have, a better quality team could do a lot more damage to this France side than Romania did today. Agreed, agreed. So, uh, Rich, sort of coming back into the the game then from the French perspective again even though they got better as the half went on, it still wasn't exactly convincing. What do you, what do you put it down to? Do you, do you sort of put it down to maybe a little bit of the weight of expectation? Was it just one of those played a lot of friendlies, takes a bit of time to get used to things again, or was there something a bit deeper lying for you? Um, there was the nerves definitely played a factor. I think everything um, going into this tournament, being hosts, being favourites, you know, all the, awful stuff that's happened in sort of the past 12 months um, in France, just a a huge weight of expectation has been put on this team to sort of uh, bring the country together, you know, to, to, to sort of unite everybody to get a good feeling going around the whole country. Uh, And that's a huge amount to put on this team. Um, So I think, yeah, nerves certainly played a factor um, in that I would say most of the game, certainly that first half. Um, it was interesting that Romania very, very quickly, I think, picked up on um, exploiting Rami. Um, him and Koscielny really do 
need to work on that communication. I know um, Koscielny has, has came out um, a couple of days ago in an interview and said that's something that they'd worked on after the, the, the recent friendly games against Cameroon and Scotland, that the whole team had got together, but certainly the defensive unit and, and Loris had all got together and said, you know, communication is an organisation. It's something we have to work on. And as was evident, I think, in that first half, it's something they continue need to continue to work on because there was plenty of times in that half where, as we've said before, a, a slightly more accomplished attacking side would have punished France far more. Um, you know, the, the spaces that they were leaving, the balls that they were leaving for each other, and and there was just a you know it was it was it was that was really concerning to see. Um, Evra, um, the amount of times he gave the ball away, he just didn't didn't seem to be concentrating. And from that, your most experienced defender, you know, one of the most experienced players in the team, um, to be struggling that early in the first game of the competition doesn't necessarily set a great tone for the younger players or the less experienced players in the squad. So the defence is definitely a worry. Um, but the problem is. Is looking at the players. This is arguably their best best back four. So there's there's work. There's certainly work to be done um, on the on the training pitch. I think before the next game. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm totally with you on that one. And just sticking with you again for a second on on Antoine Griezmann. What what did you make of his performance overall? I mean, he missed that really good chance. I say really good chance. He, in fairness, he did well to adjust to to head uh, onto the post, but. He looked a player to me. A lot of people have said he, he could be the player of the tournament, and it just didn't happen for him today. Is that a victim of the the system, the way he was asked to play, or was it just simply a, an off night for him? Um, I I think it's a combination of he's he's probably absolutely knack <laughs> to be perfectly honest. That's you good know, point, yeah. everything everything that he's done for for Atletico this season um, to then come straight into this tournament, you know, off the back of such a you know a, a disappointing. Champions League final loss as well. Um, it's it was it is also I think the system in that four three three. You know, historically I say historically he has not been in the squad that that long. But in the past, Griezmann has been used out wide and he's stuck out wide. But as he's drifted more and become some a, a more of a central player for Atletico, he clearly wants to do the same for France. And so there was so many times during the game that that he and Giroud just got far far too narrow. Um, and in a four-three-three, you just can't, you know, especially when you've got Payet, who we've said is 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 not playing out on the wing. To have your other winger then and your central striker be playing so narrow, they were getting in each other's way. They were both running for the same balls. Um, you know, I I would love to see Griezmann start as as a central striker, um, and it wouldn't surprise me if post tournament that's that's the way France go. Um, but yeah, I think I think tonight it was just a combination of of a little bit of, of tiredness. I think after the long season, um, but I think again, I think that 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 three that three up front just needs work. They the players need to be told what their positions are. If you're gonna if you're gonna stick with a four three three, then questions have to be made: as well, does Griezmann start because you have better wide options, or do you perhaps look at a slightly change of formation? Do you play with two up front, being Giroud and Griezmann, um, and then Pai just behind them? It, it, it wasn't a great game for Griezmann, and I think he, he just you know, the look that he gave when he was substituted in the second half it summed up, I think, his feeling and everyone's feelings for him in that game. It just wasn't my night. No, more to come, more to come, absolutely. And uh, Ross, what, what did you sort of make of uh, France as, as an attacking force in that first half? We'll, we'll come on to the second, but again, from your point of view, did you expect more from, from someone who maybe doesn't follow the, the, the French team as, as much as, as us two geeks? Um, what did you make of them? And, and maybe also touch on Romania and what you thought we got from them in that first half as well. well yeah, the, the first thing to say about, about France is that I... Personally, I was surprised that they stuck with so many midfielders. Um, when I saw the lineup, I was expecting Martial in there because I was expecting two quality attackers. Um, of course, Griezmann and Payet are good attackers as well, don't get me wrong, but I was still expecting a, a more uh, forward-based player than, than a midfielder to, to be in and around Giroud. Um, but I, I, I thought personally that Giroud was the wrong player for the way that Romania set up because target men, generally speaking, don't have a lot of room to manoeuvre in teams that 
uh, put those two banks of four like Romania do, and they normally get themselves shut down. And especially when Griezmann wasn't making the runs that he normally makes for Atletico, and Payet certainly wasn't making many runs. He was looking to to pick up the ball deep and and try and make a make a run and make something happen. Personally, I just thought the way that France set up was a bit naive. Um, I mean, I certainly wasn't expecting Romania to be as good as they were defensively and just in terms of organisation. But I still expected you know something to have been something to have been said backstage at France that just said, all right, these are very good defensive banks. Maybe we should go with, with, with a bit of speed and try and get them over the top. I didn't think Giroud was the right pick. And for most of that first half, you know, it, it wasn't the most impressive from, from France. They did have their chances, but not great quality. And Romania, I thought Romania, uh, to, to all their credit, were absolutely fantastic. They, they sat back and just looked at France and said, right, you either need magic or luck to get past us tonight. And thankfully for, for France, they got both for, for, the, for the two goals they ended up getting. But I thought Romania were fantastic value for money in the first half, and they would have gone in at halftime very, very happy. Mm, certainly surprised me. I'm not going to lie. It didn't, um, you know, didn't come out all guns blazing, but they were certainly organised and disciplined, which I suppose you should have expected, really. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Rich France did eventually get in, in front in the second half, 57 minutes. And uh, it was, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to call him Olivier Jabou because it just sounds funny. Um, no, he, he scored the header um, getting in in front of the goal. It has to be said, I think it's it Tatarasani, I think the keeper is for Romania, didn't exactly cover himself in glory. But nevertheless, that's what you're using the team to do, get in there where it hurts and heads it home. What did you, uh, what did you make of the goal and, and indeed Giroud's performance? Um, it was classic Giroud for France. You know, he'll get you a goal. I think that's eight goals in eight games now. Um, for him, he'll get you a goal. He'll bring a little bit of frustration because he could have scored a couple. Um, and actually, the, the the goal he scored was probably his most difficult chance of the evening, which is certainly for France it is is absolutely typical Giroud. Um, we saw in the game against uh, Scotland, you know, a neat little back heel, um, but then misses a one on one. So it. He he will he will play he will play um, you know I I can't see um, Gignac taking uh, taking his place as the as the sort of starting striker um, I do, I don't think Deschamps will 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 drop him or or bring you know Griezmann in as the central striker either but ultimately if he's you know if he can go through the tournament missing a couple of chances but scoring a goal then that that may very well be enough you know it's been talked about hugely how in recent you know in, it's right in past tournaments France have coped without a prolific goal scorer up front um so I, I again something else I tweeted, tweeted during the game he works so hard for the team uh and that's something I think that goes um sort of under the radar I think with him everyone picks up on these these chances that he misses but unlike a, a certain Real Madrid striker who shall remain unnamed? Um, he he just works non-stop for the team, fighting for the ball, uh, um, you know, getting himself, throwing himself around, and it, it is really really good to see because he can sort of g up the rest of the squad because there's, I think there's too few many players tonight who sort of let the game go by them a bit, and uh, Mr. Pogba was one that certainly springs to mind. Uh, could go on quite a bit, I think, with the my gripes about him tonight, but I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from that. I'll give you a platform in a minute, trust me, because he is somebody I wanted to touch on. So <laughs> you, <laughs> you can feel free to get the soapbox out. It's not a problem. <laughs> um, Ross, uh, obviously France getting in front. And at that point, I think most of us probably thought or well, could be forgiven for thinking that that was it. Game set and match, probably go on to score another one or two goals and it would be very comfortable. Um, and then Patrice Evra happened. Um, <laughs> what, what did you make of that whole incident that led to the penalty and the eventual equaliser from Stanku? Because I thought both fullbacks were at fault, really. Sanya's uh, clearance was not the best. And, and then Evra just just had a momentary lapse because he's been very good for Juventus this season. But that was, well, what did you think? Well, I, I think that Sagna's mistake could have been mopped up very easily if, if ever had just kept his nose out of it, because I've got no idea what he's doing throwing a, throwing a boot in as he does. Because the ball is, is, is up in the air. It's not like his, his boot is going anywhere near the ball. The player is staring right at it and isn't looking at anything other than the ball, but you've got a covering defender, you've got a goalkeeper to rush out, and it's a very good goalkeeper as well. 
there's that there's no good reason, in my opinion, for Everett to, to throw his boot out as he does. And it deserves to be a penalty. The only thing that surprised me was it took the referee so long to decide that it was a penalty. Apparently he needed some help from the fifth official for it. But for me, it was it was stonewall. It was one of those, as soon as I saw it, it my hands were in the air saying, well, why aren't you giving that? So, bizarre decision from Everett, and it almost punished them. Really, really, really strange decision. What what did you make of that as well, Rich? Because I know there's, there's quite a split in, in French fans from what I can gather on sort of social media side of things about who they'd like to see in the fullback positions, but particularly the the sort of the Luca Dean argument. Are you happy with Sanya and Ever as, as you're starting two fullbacks? I've grown to become satisfied with Sanya, um, purely because right back is such a problem position for France. There's beyond Sanya, Jalet, arguably Debushi, there's there's so little coming through for the future. So I'm I'm you know, I'm I've grown sort of reluctantly to become acceptable of, of Sanya in the right back role. Evra there's so it's the opposite then for the left backs. There's so many good left backs, young left backs coming through for France that have just been prevented from making progress in the national side because Evra's just hung on and on and on. And it's been a long time now since he's played well for France. Um, and tonight he just had a, from from minute one, he just had a shocker. He was, as I mentioned earlier, he was you know, losing balls left, right and centre. He's being outpaced, out-tackled, out-muscled. And then just to, you know, icing on the cake really was, was the most needless penalty to give away. Uh, what he was thinking, I don't know. Nowhere near the ball, you know, leaving a lazy boot in, however you want to describe it. It was just clueless from him. Um, whether whether that has an impact on, on his role in the team come next game, I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, but it, it, he was by far, by far... Um, France's worst player tonight. Mm, I'm with you, I do wonder about Sebastian Courtier when you were saying about the. Um... He's he's the, literally the only one. Mm, he is, he's isn't li- he? He's literally the only one, and he's 25, I think now. Yeah, he's no spring chicken, is he? No, I agree. It's weird to ask Germany about right backs; they've got the same problem apparently. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, it was. Uh, I have to say, I kind of got to the stage where I was thinking, okay, it's going to be a 1-1 draw. We've seen it before with teams where they start a tournament slowly and and uh, sort of ease their way into tournaments, if you will. Um, but then, Rich, as we were just saying, uh, Dimitri Payet pops up. 89th minute. Some, some good work from Kingsley Coman, has to be said, who, who came on, I thought, made a, a really good impression, actually, when he, when he came on. He was direct and, and sort of did what he does best, pace and decent bit of speed on that wing. And uh, in came the ball. I didn't even have a second thought. You knew what he was going to do, and uh, he's he's become quite the um, he's become quite the, the, the expert at that little flick in off the bar type of shot from distance. Mm. Um, and I mean, it was just a delightful goal, wasn't it? It was just just quickly to to touch on um, on on Coman. That's exactly why he's in the squad to come in when he did to inject that bit of urgency. You know, France were just starting to flag a little bit, but he came on, he brought pace, he was direct, he stuck to the wing, exactly what you want in that 4-3-3 formation. Um, you know, great stuff from him, um, and he will continue to offer that throughout the tournament. But the goal, uh, absolutely fantastic finish. You know, the more you watch it, and there's a there's a particular angle from sort of just behind Paye where you just see how absolutely perfectly struck it was just to curl just inside that top corner I mean you know keeper barely moved but I think that was just to save his own blushes I think because even if he'd have dived full strength there's no way he was saving that Um, and it's just remarkable to see that what two months ago three months ago there was debates about is Pae going to even be in the squad and now all of a sudden he's probably the first name down on that starting 11. Um, you know, tonight he was the best player uh, on the pitch, closely followed by N'Golo Kanta, I must admit. Mm. Um, but but what he offered, the little bit of skill, ironically enough, everyone talked about his his, um, his dead ball talent. 
that was pretty woeful from yeah, like, it the, was. Amount of, the amount of corners and free kicks that didn't even beat the first man was remarkable but ultimately he he offered he, well he was the go-to man for anything creative it was his piece of trickery his movement his passing um that instigated everything positive about France tonight so to for him to get the goal and in such a fantastic manner was 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 excellent to see yeah, 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 agree. And uh, Russ, what, what do you sort of overall? Obviously, it's an opening day victory. You know, it's it's a good performance overall. If if you sort of take out the the scratchy periods, but you know they they got the result. That's the most important thing when you're you're hosting and there's a lot of pressure on you. Anything you saw tonight that either particularly impressed or particularly alarmed you as as one of the favourites for the tournament? Um, I don't think I was overly impressed by many areas of France. They they just did the job in the end. The the biggest concern for me, and and I know this is is sacrilege for for you, but um, considering how shaky the back line is, I'm stunned that Matuidi started over Schneidlin. For me, the way you progress from this game is you learn that your back four is is not as solid as you thought it was going into this tournament, or not as solid as you hoped it would be after all the training sessions. You look at it and say, we need more protection, we need to sacrifice someone. And I didn't think Matuidi had the most influential game tonight for, for France. So for me, I would say that the, the, the thing that France have to learn from this is that that back four needs more protection against better teams. And the best player you've got for that job is pairing Schneidlin with Kante for me. Yeah, he's definitely a more defensive option, isn't he? I, I, as you say, it's sacrilege to me just because I love Blaise Matuidi, but I think Rich would 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 testify he's not been his best season for PSG, and no. injuries and whatnot have, have hindered his season a lot. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that one that one. Develops. I think I think I think the only thing to say on that is I think the the reason one of the reasons Matuidi Matuidi is in there is purely for his the sort of engine room that he can offer. You know, that the endless running. And it, it wasn't his great game, and it's it's off the back of not his best season either. But I, I still don't believe, and I don't think Deschamps believes it either, they cannot at the minute fully rely on Pogba to be the man people are thinking that he will be. Um, he's, he's, he's too unpredictable. Um, there's a little bit too much arrogance at times that you know drifts into becoming or appearing quite lazy. So someone like... Matuidi alongside him in midfield can just add that bit of uh, both cover in terms of defence, but also then in terms of going forward as well, that perhaps Schneidlin doesn't quite have. I could see why Schneidlin could come in, um, because you can't rely on Kante to mop up on all, for all the mistakes that the back line makes. Um, but I think that that's probably the reason why Matuidi is in there, because he is that box-to-box player that, that that every side I think needs. Yeah, he's. Um, I, I just love, as you say, his energy and, and uh, his sort of direct play when he's um, breaking up tackles. He's just one into the pitch to the other. But then Kante again, as you said as, as well today, was just just so impressive. That tackle that he put in on the touchline earlier on. Uh, um, and the problem that, that France was... have really got is that I'm looking at the team now. There's no one there you could realistically drop. You know, you're playing at home. Yeah. This tournament is in France, so you can't really justify getting rid of Griezmann because you're going to have the fans on your back there and then. You know, you, you can't take out Pogba because he's your, he's your star man. You can't really take out Matuidi. You can't really take out Kante. So this team just just has to work, but I don't think it's going to. And I think personally that Deschamps needs to needs to put Schneidlin in just to make sure things are a bit safer. But at the same time, he's he's going to have the whole country on his back if he takes out any of those at the moment. Mm. Depending on who the opposition is, of course, I guess. But the um, touching on that that uh, that side about Pogba you were mentioning as well, the Rich um, Ross, I'll just get your thoughts on on Pogba as well because he's. I, I agree with Rich. The the arrogant side of things, it makes him brilliant and it, it makes him frustrating at the same time. His reaction to being substituted that was um, moment of the tournament already for me. <laughs> he looked genuinely staggered that he'd been taken off. Do you um, do you think this? This will be the tournament everyone expects it to be, having, you know, only seen limited amounts of him for the last year. Again, you, your view might be untainted. So, what, what do you think to, to him tonight and overall? I, I only ever, personally, I only ever hear about Pogba when he puts one in from thirty yards. I, I don't hear about him otherwise. You know, there's plenty of players out on the continent that I hear on Twitter. About, oh, he had a good game. He was very impressive. Set up this goal. Looked very dangerous, etc. I only ever hear about Pogba when he when he scores an absolute screamer. So I never know what to expect when I do get round to seeing him. 
And tonight he did look very Hollywood. He did look like he was looking for a, a big special moment to open his tournament. And for me, I don't think it's a massive surprise that he came off because he wasn't all that um, you know, influential on the game. And there were better options to come on from the bench. So I, I don't know what to expect from, from Pogba. I said this on the, 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 the preview pod that I thought this tournament was, was going to be Pyatt's. You know, I, th- I thought he was going to have a really good tournament and you probably had to do a highlight reel at the end of it of his free kicks and whatever else. So I, I don't think that Pogba is the star man this year for me, unless he, unless he really does put something in from 30 yards in the next one. But I think he's being overshadowed in, in this tournament, in, in this current France setup. And whether that's just a case of him maturing or whether he needs to, to calm himself down to really unlock all of that, I'm, I'm not sure as someone that doesn't see him very often. But certainly I... I from watching him today, I get the impression of someone that thinks he's Hollywood and thinks he's the banner boy, but at the moment isn't. Agreed. Anything you want to add to that, Rich? Yeah, I think there's a bit of envy, I think, from Pog as well, because I think when, when he sees Pae, Pae's playing probably in the, the position, the role that Pogba probably wants to play for France. You know, he's he's got the skills, he's scoring the goals, he's taking the set pieces. I think all of those, I think, are, are areas that Pogba probably would like to be on him, you know, all this talk and, you know, Lekeep this this morning had the picture of Pogba alongside Platini and and Zidane, Um, you know, talking about history repeating itself and him being, you know, a Juve number 10 in a French side uh, in a a major European tournament. Uh, And I think he's let that go to his head a little bit. Um, I I still maintain, and I'm sure there's going to be hundreds of Juventus fans um, yeah, we'll will will we'll whinge at me for this, but I still maintain no one really knows what his best position is. Certainly, that's the case for France. I couldn't tell you what his best position is. I think it's fairly clear that Deschamps doesn't really know what what his best position is. Um, but he's one of those players of can you afford to drop him? Uh, um, <laughs> you know, we saw that wonderful cross. I think. I think it was in the Cameroon friendly game where from, you know, out on the touch line, almost on the halfway line, he turned and produced a pin perfect cross around the whole, you know, straight, basically straight onto the penalty spot for, for Giroud. Mm. And it's moments like that that make you think just produce that more often. Um, so he's one of those players I mean, to, to sell him off tonight was, I, I genuinely didn't see that. I thought Matuidi was going to be the player to come off. So for, for Deschamps to have the sort of balls really to to say, actually, you know what, Pogba, you're not having a good game. You're coming off. Uh, and you're right. The look the look that Pogba gave was, was fantastic. Um, and perhaps that's what will be needed. You know, perhaps that will then put some, knock some sense into him of thinking, well, actually, you know what? If I'm being substituted off, this is supposed to be my tournament. You know, that didn't happen to Zidane. That didn't happen to Platini. They weren't substituted off in the opening game. Um, so perhaps, you know, that's a, you know, perhaps that was a clever, you know, a more clever move than we thought from Deschamps. Mm, yeah, sort of sets the um, agenda and reminds him just who is in charge, whether he likes it or, or not. So, yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, nevertheless, um, France get off to to an opening day victory then um, in front of 75,113 in, in Stade So uh, a, a decent start uh, result-wise. I just want to get your guys' thoughts uh, very quickly on next oppositions for both teams. Um, which is something I want to do on, on every pod. So looking ahead, so you'd have to say then from the position now with France having won, they're obviously going to be favourites for the group. We knew that anyway. They face Albania next on Wednesday, whereas Romania face Switzerland on Wednesday also. Ross, let's start with Romania. Um, it sounds silly to say win or bust, but depending on what Switzerland do tomorrow, do you think that's a game they're going to have to look at and think they're going to have to be a bit more adventurous now? Um Maybe, but I, I also think that they could they could get away with that being nil nil and then beat Albania and you know you, you never know with the third place playoff. I'm not sure I, the ins and outs of it yet because it's the first time we've seen it, but you never know. Um, I, I would expect them to be a bit more attacking because Switzerland are not France going forward, but at the same time they have got some very dangerous players and they do need to just make sure they keep their shape. But at the same time, it wouldn't stagger me to see Romania try and get the nil nil and then 
try and go a bit firmer against go, against Albania in the hopes they can just get third and maybe sneak through in that. Mm, yeah, I, I do share your thoughts there. And uh, Rich, Albania, obviously, uh, against France next up. Now, it's pretty much guaranteed that if France win that, they would be through. Do you expect them to be a lot more sharp, a lot more sort of at it and, and really go at Albania to get this done and dusted as early as possible? Yeah, you'd like to think so. They were, they wouldn't really want to be wanting to rely on having to get a result in the Switzerland game. You know, you'd like that to be more a, a slightly more relaxed affair than you know it's it's a must win final group game. Um, that I'm fairly you know fairly confident going into that tonight. Actually, probably was a good test. They came up against um, uh, organised opposition. Um, who provided enough of a enough of a threat going forward to remind Deschamps to work on that defence, um, but not enough that that really punished them that it would have actually not the confidence to to uh, to ground level. So I think actually hard fought as it was, and you know there were negative points and probably negative points outweighed the positives. To to get that win, I, I think actually is is in a weird way, an excellent start for France. You know, it's it's given them the kick they need without completely damaging confidence. Um and it'll then allow them to to, you know, during the week or until Wednesday, work in training and then come out and be a slightly more you know, I was gonna I was gonna say slightly less pressurized environment, but then I look down and see that they're playing in Marseille. Marseille, so. absolutely yeah. <laughs> Perhaps that'd be the wrong, wrong, uh, wrong expression. But to you know that pressure of that first game, I think opening ceremony, first game of the tournament, their own first game, everything that that brings with it. So to have got the win, arguably fortuitous circumstances because Romania worked very, very hard. Um, yeah, I think it'll allow them to kick on and and you know put in a, a bit more of a convincing performance on Wednesday. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, uh, we will um, we'll leave the opening game there, but uh, I have just got a little bit of time where I'm gonna I'm gonna do something really mean to uh, every guest I have every day on these pods. I'm gonna ask you to um, to look ahead at games that you might not know anything you're about. You predict, aren't you? Well, not quite, but I am gonna ask you for your thoughts on tomorrow's games. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to be nice to you, Ross. I'm going to give you one game that you will know a bit about, but I'm going to start with uh, asking you what you think we can uh, expect from Albania, Switzerland, which is the first game to kick us off for tomorrow. Um, do you see that being? Do you see that being quite a fun game or quite a? Neither of us want to lose this game. Uh, on paper, I don't see it being much different to France, Romania, except Albania probably won't be as organised because they just haven't got the same kind of quality that Romania do. But um, it's tournament football. I'm sure Albania will be looking at that third spot as well. So, uh, so you never know. But I would expect Switzerland to, to come out with the win in that one. OK, so a loose prediction. You're going with the Swiss. Uh, I can take that. I'm happy with that. Um, and uh, what, what's your thoughts, Rich, on moving on to a different group? We've got Wales, Slovakia tomorrow. Um, obviously, not quite as exciting for you as, as the French, I'm sure. But <laughs> if you'll be tuning in, do you, um, do you foresee that being the Gareth Bale show or the nobody really realised how good Slovakia are show? Uh, it's very much Bale or bust, isn't it, for, for Wales? Um, if he's not at his best, you can't see them really making progress out of this group, to be honest. Um, Slovakia, yes. They, I think there is going to be a big, big case. I think the um, the win, um, their recent win against uh, Germany uh, was the big, you know, was a, was a wake-up call for everybody. Um, so... I, I personally, I would, I would go with a Slovakia win in that. Um, I think as as good as Bale is, um, to be asking him now in a in a major tournament and Wales' its first one for, well, decades, um, it's going to be too much to ask. And and Slovakia, I think, overall have just that little bit extra quality. But I think it will be a good game. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm with you. So we're going, uh, we're going with Switzerland for the first game and Slovakia for the second. Um, and it, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you both for your thoughts on, on the English. Uh, Ross, from a journalistic point of view, first of all, um, there's been uh, there's been trouble overseas from English fans. I mean, who'd have seen that coming? Mm. 
Honestly, um, now it have to be said to, to be unbiased here. Uh, there is always two sides to every story, I'm sure, three or four sides in, in some cases. But the images and video that's been on social media tonight has not particularly looked good. I think it's fair to say. What do you make of, of both the English side heading into their first game and indeed the fans heading into the first game? Um, well, British fans abroad will be British fans aboard. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's just the way some people are from this country. Um, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I don't advocate it. And hopefully the French can stamp it out. I think it's a, a, a great reflection of the intelligence of some people that go to, to these tournaments that you're going to a country that is on high terror alert and with police on every street corner and then starting a riot. Um, but the, the, the fans, as, as long as, you know, as long as they keep it low key can realistically do whatever they like while they're out there and enjoy it. But, you know, you need to, you need to use some kind of decorum. Um, as for the team, it's it's tough to know exactly how England are going to look um, tomorrow night. You'd like to think they will be as far away from the Portugal performance as possible. But um, at the same time, we, we know from previous tournaments now how important it is to make sure you come away with something from your first game. Especially with a team this young, they're going to need to get some confidence in, in, in the tournament setting. So I'd like to think England will come out strongly. and I'd like to think that we'll get something from that game. I would tip England to win it. But um, it all does depend really on, on how that back line holds up, because much like the French, it, uh, it is a little shaky and it hasn't got the best cover. Agreed, agreed. And you will, of course, be back tomorrow to talk about it. So uh, we shall have you there. I will give, uh, give you the final word, Rich. Um, what's your sort of thoughts on, on all things English? Um, maybe not follow the, following them like, like me, but uh, what, what do you sort of anticipate from this first game with, with the Russians? And, and if you have a view on, on the Brits abroad, do, do share as well. Um, well, on the fans, it's, it's just sadly, it's that perfect storm, isn't it? You've got a small minority of ignorant, ignorant English fans up against a small minority of ignorant Russian fans up against a small minority of ignorant fan, you know, French fans in Marseille. I don't want to label them as Marseille fans because chances, you know, they might not be, but locals in, in Marseille. Um, it just seems like a group, you know, groups within those three factions have gone just with the intent to wind each other up and cause this mayhem. Um, and I was listening to uh, the radio on the uh, on the way home this evening, um, and they were interviewing fans. And and you know, there's there's plenty out there who are there genuinely just to have a good time, to see the football. Um, it is just though that that sort of ignorant, moronic minority. Um, and with with all the talk of all the you know this this threat of terrorism that's underlining really this whole tournament and all the effort that France have gone in to provide the security, to allow the fans to feel safe when they come to this tournament, then to be, you know, English fans, Russian fans, you know, fans of the, you know, football fans, if you like, although they're not really football fans, for it to be those that are causing the bother just smacks everything in the face. And it, you know, it just adds more, um, anger really on top of it you know everything that france has had to go through in the past 12 months um and all the security fears they've had the whole country has been you know on this, this sort of on edge for so long um and it's you know it's ruined basically by by these these idiots so rant aside back to the actual football match <laughs> um again i think i think it should be another good game i think when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, I rather foolishly perhaps predicted. I think I think England actually will do quite well in this tournament, um, and I think I, I don't think many. I know well. I know some. I know some are saying, yeah, yeah, they'll definitely you know, semi-finals is a, is sort of a minimum. Semi-finals is a fantastic achievement. You know, they they have this really really young squad, but I, I genuinely believe that the players they've got and the form they're in. Um, you know, he finally sort of form players are being picked for England rather than just a stodgy standard eleven. So it'll be a good game. I think England will just about do enough. Um, I think I think if I remember reading right, Russia have lost a couple of key players. Um, so it'll be a good game, close game, but I think England will just sneak it. Yep, 
Yeah, I think I'm with you on that. And as you say, Russia have been decimated injury-wise, so that's going to be tough for them. Right, OK, before we leave, I'm going to do something on every podcast that we do throughout the Euros. Um, we have a little section on our, our regular podcast called The Hipster's Choice, which is obviously where we take a player and profile him beyond the Vinci beyond or in between inch of his life and uh, we kind of scrape the surface of all the bits and bobs that he or she has done over the season uh, well this time I'm just going to get uh, a very straightforward quick hipster's choice and it is the player of the day essentially um, so I'm just going to get all of our guests to give us their one name for the player of that given day I've got a funny feeling we might have a full house here um, <laughs> but uh, Ross let's start with you your hipster's choice on day one is Pyatt and Rich, your hipster's choice on day one is? Uh, as good as Kante was, it has to be Payet. It is indeed a full house. Yep, have to say. Um, one game in fairness. I'm sure tomorrow we'll have some mixed uh, mixed answers with three games to choose from. But yes, today's uh, hipster's choice is indeed Dimitri Payet. So uh, well done to him and well done to France. Um, so that is podcast number one out the way. Uh, I would like to thank both Ross and Rich for joining me this evening. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Yep, most welcome. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. And uh, we will no doubt. Um, well, Ross is definitely back tomorrow, and uh, and throughout the tournament, I've got him. Uh, I've got him on on alert all the way through for the UK coverage. Yeah, I drew the short um, straw with the Irish ones. Didn't I? Yes, you did. And uh, and I'm sure if uh, if if Rich's schedule um, works out, I'm sure we'll have him back on as well. And uh, uh, you, you might have to fight Lana, possibly Rich, because I know she's chomping at the bit to come back on and and have a little round. So. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, it. that's if Deschamps can handle it yes that's true that is very very true uh, but yeah I'm sure we'll be back and uh, do tune in tomorrow we'll be back around about the same time uh, where we go through three games of uh, of the the, um, the tournament tomorrow so it's underway we are off and running in Euro 2016 podcast one is out the way uh, we'll be back tomorrow with all of the latest news and action and I'll just say the immortal words for the summer keep your satchel clean and your pipe stoked we've been the football hipsters thanks for tuning in now it drops to Fabregas, who looks for Iniesta, who's onside! Spain score! That's on. Well, he is a match winner. Is this the moment it is? Divock Origi!